I'm Joshua Bardwell. Today, you're going to learn something. Today, we're going to learn about something called reactants. Reactants is the thing that means you need to run ground wires to your ESCs. Have I got your interest? Let's get into it. Let's start with the fundamentals. In an electrical circuit, we've got a conductor, like for example, a wire, and there is a voltage potential across that conductor. So for example, at one end of the conductor, there may be zero volts potential, and at the other end of the conductor, there may be, let's say, 10 volts potential. And the voltage potential across that conductor will cause current to flow. The flow of the current will be opposed by a characteristic of the wire known as its resistance, which is measured in ohms. And the current flow itself is measured in amps. The relationship between these three properties is described by Ohm's law, which may be one of the most fundamental things you should know about if you work with electricity as a hobbyist. Uh, and the relationship is that current equals the potential divided by the resistance, I equals V over R. Now, in case you don't have a sort of intuitive mathematical basis for what this means, what it means is that the more potential or pressure there is pushing the electrons to move through the circuit, the more current will flow. Right? That makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, but the flow of the electrons is being opposed by the resistance of the conductor. And so the more resistance there is, the less current will flow. And you can think about sucking a uh, liquid through a straw, right? If you try and suck through a very, very small straw, you'll have to suck really hard to get a lot of liquid. Whereas if you have a great big straw, you don't have to suck very hard to get a lot of liquid. So there's resistance and pressure and current flow. Now let's build a circuit, and in this circuit, we're going to have a conductor. Here's our wire, and we're going to have some things attached to this conductor. Like, for example, here we're going to have the flight controller, and here we're going to have an ESC. Let's say that this is the ground wire for the flight controller and the ESC. And then we could say that we've also got the signal wire for the flight controller and the ESC. And the potential difference between these two is going to be how the flight controller and the ESC communicate values. So they're going to measure the voltage difference between these two. So the ESC and the flight controller are going to communicate those pulses that we talk about when we talk about PWM or multi-shot, and we talk about there being a 1,000 microsecond pulse or whatever, and that pulse is a high voltage, like that could be 5 volts or 3.3 volts, depending on what uh, logic level they're using, and that difference in potential between the ground and the signal is how we define those pulses. Now, I said that what matters is the difference between the signal and the ground wire. So, another way to think of this is that the ground reference is the water on which the flight controller, here's its little boat, and the ESC, here's its little boat, are floating. And the flight controller is going to send signals to the ESC, and those signals are going to either be high or low. And when the signal is down at the water level, then that's zero volts. And when the signal is up here, then that's five volts or 3.3 volts or whatever the signaling level is that we're using. And the key thing about this analogy is that if this water level moves up or down, the voltage potential doesn't change. And this is exactly what electrical noise from the motors and the ESCs does. Uh, it puts voltage potential back into the system. And that, that voltage potential doesn't just neatly go 
only onto the signal wire where, where, where voltage potential belongs. It goes all throughout the system and it changes the voltage reference level of the ground as well as, as, well as the signal. But you can see in this scenario that as long as the flight controller and the ESC are both riding on the water together, that a change in the voltage potential of the ground will not corrupt the signal at all. They will both ride up and down on the water together, and the relative difference between the signal level and the ground reference will be the same. So how then does electrical noise corrupt the signal, which we know for a fact that it does? To get to that answer, we go back to reactants, the thing I opened talking about. The essence of reactants is that when you apply a voltage potential across a conductor, the voltage potential does not propagate across the conductor instantaneously. Rather, the current or the voltage potential propagates through the conductor at a certain speed. And it's more than just the propagation speed. So for example, if this were a copper wire, then if we were to measure the propagation of the electrical impulse through the wire, uh, it would be at about two-thirds the speed of light. At least that's what I learned back in my networking classes. That's the actual sort of propagation velocity, but that's not actually what we're talking about. To understand what we're talking about, I want you to think of this wire as if it were a garden hose. And we're going to start applying a pressure across the hose, and it's going to start filling up with water. Okay? You can see that if I start applying the pressure at t equals zero, time equals zero, the hose will fill up with water, and there will be some propagation velocity of that wave front as it, as it moves through the hose. And if it gets to the end of the hose, and there is some resistance at the end of the hose, imagine that the, the walls of the hose will flex somewhat. So this is not a rigid pipe but it is a, it's a, like a garden hose, and the walls of the hose have a little bit of flex. And so what you'll see is that there will be a moment when the water has filled the hose, but the pressure has not maximized, and the walls of the hose will kind of flex outward, and the hose will take on just a little bit of extra water. And by the same token, if we were to remove the, the, the whatever's stopping up the end of the hose and let the water flow out of the hose, there would be a moment where the hose collapsed inwards, back in on itself, and spewed out and ejected that extra water that it had taken on when it first filled up. So I want you to be comfortable with the idea that when we pump water into a hose, there's not a fixed volume that can occur there, but it can sort of take a little bit of extra, and likewise, when we take water out of a hose, that little bit of extra can come out. And when we do this with electricity, the same concepts are called capacitance and inductance. Capacitance refers to the ability of a conductor to store energy in its electric field and the other thing you might or might not know is that anytime you have current flowing through a conductor, you also get a magnetic field that's built up around the conductor. And that's the, that's the reason why when you were in you know, elementary school or whatever and you built a, an electromagnet by wrapping a wire around a nail right, and hooking it up to a battery, right, that's the magnetic field that you created was caused by the current flowing through that wire. So anytime you have current flowing through a wire, you, you build up a magnetic field as well. Magnetic. Magnetic. And the electric and the magnetic field of the wire can store energy. Capacitance refers to the ability of the conductor to store energy in its electric field. Inductance refers to the ability of the conductor to store energy in its magnetic field. And the thing you need to know is that capacitance and inductance kind of act like the, the flexible walls of the garden hose. When you pump electrical energy into a circuit, you have to fill up the electric and magnetic capacity, the capacitance and inductance of the circuit, before the circuit stabilizes. And here's why that becomes relevant to the topic at hand. What this means is that, go back to the analogy of the, the water and the boats. Now what I drew was 
a water level like this with the boats floating on it. And the idea was that if we apply noise to the system and therefore we change the voltage level of the ground reference, what we drew was that the, the level would rise like this, but the ESC and the flight controller would both be floating on it. And as the voltage reference level changed, nothing would, nothing would really change because the potential difference between the signal wire and the ground reference hadn't changed. But that is not actually how it goes. What happens is that when we put noise into the system, because of reactive effects, inductance and capacitance, it takes some time for the noise to propagate through the system. And what that means is that as there is a voltage potential change, say near the flight controller, I'll just do that because it's convenient to draw left to right, the ground reference of the flight controller will be raised while the ground reference of the ESC is still down there. Here's our ESC, here's our flight controller, and you can see that they're no longer at the same ground reference level. And what that means is that if the flight controller sends a 5 volt signal, the ESC will see not 5 volts. You can see whatever voltage potential is being measured here is significantly greater than 5 volts. And that can work the other way too. It can cause the ESC to see much less than 5 volts. So here we come to kind of the, the payoff of the whole discussion. Because real circuits have reactive effects, because they have capacitance and inductance, changes in voltage potential do not propagate instantaneously across the circuit. And what that means is that anytime you have a change in voltage at one point in the circuit, there will be some time delay before that change in voltage is propagated to all the other parts of the circuit. And what that means is that in real circuits, you cannot assume that the ground reference is constant at every part of the circuit. So how then does signal ground help with this scenario? Well, let's draw the ESC. Now we'll represent the ESC on the left, and we've got, let's call this power ground. And here we've got the flight controller. And don't worry about the signal wire for now. We'll forget, forget about that for the time being. And let's say that the ESC is putting noise into this electrical system. And so as we have some change in voltage potential, that has to propagate out across the system through whatever else you've got here, you know, through uh, your PDB and your voltage regulator and yada, 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 yada. It's got to propagate through all that stuff, and eventually it gets to the flight controller, and now they're at the same voltage potential, except, oops, nope, they're probably not, because there's more noise has changed the voltage level again. Oops, oh well. When you add a signal ground going directly from the ESC signal pad to the flight controller signal pad, you provide a, a, a low resistance and very direct path for any changes in voltage to propagate directly between them. And, and by making the changes in voltage be able to propagate more directly and more quickly between them, you ensure that the ground reference level for the ESC and the flight controller signal circuits is as close to the same as possible. Okay, so I'll sum up one more time because this was complicated and I bet some of you were struggling to keep up. If we were to assume that voltage differences propagated through a circuit instantaneously, then noise on the ground plane would not corrupt signal values because the noise would change the ground reference level, but since everybody is referring to the ground ref, that's why they call it the reference level, since everybody is measuring against the ground reference level, the voltage potential between the signal and ground would remain the same. Real circuits have characteristics called capacitance and inductance, which are together known as reactants, and they mean that changes in voltage potential do not propagate instantaneously across a real circuit. The circuit has to take some time to soak up current before the voltage potential propagates across the circuit. What that means is that anytime you have current flow, anytime you have high frequency noise, or anytime you have a change in voltage potential, all three of those things are really just different ways of saying the same thing. Anytime you have those things, you can't assume that the ground plane is at the same voltage potential everywhere across itself. And what that means is that you can measure a different potential difference 
between the signal and the ground at two different points, even when they're supposed to be the same. Adding a dedicated signal ground means that the voltage potential differences don't have to propagate all the way up through the power ground and across the PDB and all that long path. Rather, they propagate directly through the signal ground along with the signal. And what that means is that the voltage potential between the signal wire and the signal ground is preserved, even in the face of noise. Just to add one more thing, this also helps to explain why some people get away with not running the signal ground, and other people sometimes have problems with it. If you have very short signal wires, if you have a relatively noise-free copter, and other sorts of conditions, it can be the case that the, noise, the voltage potential moves through the system quickly enough that you don't get signal corruption and everything is fine. On the other hand, you can get to a threshold where suddenly your signals are being corrupted and then your copter starts dropping out of the air and you fix it by running the ground wire. I would also hazard a guess that some people who are not running the ground wire and think their copter's flying fine are actually experiencing more signal corruption than they realize. This would be evidenced by, by rough running motors, but maybe they just don't know the difference. You, there's certainly no way for us to know how much signal corruption is actually happening in our copters. So why then doesn't everybody run the ground wire? And the answer to that is that running the ground wire opens up the potential for another thing called ground loops. And the argument against running the ground wire is ground loops. Now, I'm not going to talk about ground loops right now. Maybe I'll do another video about that another time. I will tell you, though, that my opinion is that you should always run the ESC signal ground unless you find that there's a problem that makes you need to remove it. The typical uh, symptom of a ground loop is noise in your video. And if you have really noisy video and you've run the ground wire and you just can't figure out why you're getting such noisy video, consider removing the ground wire from your ESCs. But in general, I think more problems are created by leaving the ground wire off than by running it. And my recommendation is that you run it. Well, I hope you feel smarter. And if any of that went over your head, go back and watch it again. YouTube will not mind. Thanks for watching. Happy flying.